three uh, things. Uh, the first uh, is I will outline a cosmological argument. Um, parts of this will not have much to do with cosmology other than just the maybe by pun. Um, but there will be cosmological components of, of a simple sort. Um, uh, one of the components there is I'm going to say something negative about the measure problem. Um, and then the second part of the talk is I will try to substantiate that from my point of view as a formal epistemologist and probability theorist. Um, and then if there's time, I may just muse a little bit on uh, Joel Primack's question to me at lunch yesterday, what implications there might be of cosmology for theology. So let me start with the cosmological argument. Um, Cosmological. So a cosmological argument is this kind of argument for the existence of something like a, like a God. Um, it's an explanatory argument. It starts with some observation about the world and comes up with and tries to come up with an explanation for it. Um, classically, the sorts of things that uh, cosmological arguments have tried to find explanations for have been very uncontroversial large-scale facts, like something exists, or something moves, or something causes something, or, yeah, these sorts of things. Um, in this way, they differ from other arguments for the existence of God. For instance, the argument from miracles. You might look at it, one version of it, might start with very controversial explanatory claims, like that so-and-so rose from the dead. In that case, the, the fact to be explained is the really controversial part, and it's somewhat less controversial to go from there to the existence of God, perhaps, though still not trivial. In this case, we tend to start with the fact, in the cosmological argument, we start with facts that tend to be fairly uncontroversial. Um, and the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to just sort of conglomerate a whole bunch of facts into what I would call a big fact. And there's many ways of writing the argument, and so many ways you could write, you could make things be the big fact. So what kind of big fact could be, you could take all the laws of nature, all the constants, and all the initial conditions, um, and conjoin them all into one gigantic claim. And that would be your big fact, what we want to find an explanation for. And I guess in this case, it would be controversial to what the details of the big fact are, but that there is such a big fact and, uh, that it's true doesn't seem like much of a problem, apart from maybe some formal worries. Um, another option would be to make the big fact be something like a conjunction of all contingent truths. Um, I'm going to be throwing around words like possibility, contingency, and necessity, so I want to say a little bit about those terms. Uh, when I use these terms, I use them in what people call the metaphysical sense. So, there's one sense of necessity, is what the laws of nature require. So it's necessary that, uh, that objects move a certain way in a gravitational field. That laws of nature are required, and the requiring could either, either be understood in terms of governance, or it could just mean the fact that this law is true entails that they move in this way if they are in these conditions. That's not the kind of necessity I, I want. I want this more stringent necessity. Um, but there's perhaps a more stringent, a very stringent necessity is something like logical provability, right? So there are some facts I can just prove using logic alone. Um, I don't know, maybe in, a, in an appropriate deductive system, for any, I can prove that for any proposition P, either P or not. Okay, some controversial inference rules together, but I can, can do it. Um, uh, I can prove much more complicated things in a deduction system. I can prove maybe, why well, not? I can, but, we, but humanity can prove things like, you know, by logic alone, that, from, that if this conjunction of axioms that includes the Euclidean axioms and a few more that up here have figured out we need. Um, if this conjunction of axioms is true, then the Pythagorean 
equality is true. Stuff like that. Right? You can just prove that by logic alone. Um, and that's a kind of necessity. And it's a much more stringent one than the physics kind of necessity. Um, right? The violations of laws of nature um, can be quite coherent in the logical sense. And corresponding to each kind of necessity, there is a kind of possibility, right? So something is possible, provided that its denial isn't necessary. So, uh, it's possible that there are unicorns, just in case it's not necessary that there aren't any. Uh, and where you have a more stringent kind of necessity, you have a more liberal kind of possibility. Right? So there are many more things that are sort of narrowly logically possible than there are things that are uh, than there are things that are physically possible. Okay, um, and then there's the contingent, and something is contingent provided that it is neither necessary nor impossible, um, and. By and large, it's pretty plausible that what science investigates is the realm of the contingent, right? It's in, it, in, in some strong sense of uh, necessity. Um, it investigates things that could be so, but don't have to be so, in a strong sense of have to. But let me go back to the have to, the necessity. So I said there's this weaker sort of necessity, which is what the laws of nature require. And there's the strongest sense, which is the, what logic narrowly understood requires, which you can give a formal proof of. There's very good reason to think there's something in between these two. Let me give some examples of this. Let me argue for this by example. Um, I am not a number. A standard example of these sorts of things. I am not a number. That's necessarily true. I couldn't possibly be a number. Um, there's nothing in the laws of nature that's going to. I don't. Know. I don't know what laws of nature to say. What they'll say about this. Um, but there's certainly nothing in pure logic that excludes my being a number. Uh, you're going to need some kind of weird. I mean, if you're going to be able to prove this from logic alone, you're going to need an axiom about me, and then you're going to need infinite. A presumably similar axioms about everybody else, and that's just not how logic works, right? So you're not going to get a, a, a pr proof that I am not a number, but it's still necessary. I mean, it just just seems utterly impossible that I be a number, um, particularly so since Platonism is false, and so there cannot be any numbers. <laughs> but even if you think Platonism is true. You should still think that, that I couldn't be a number. Um, I can give other examples. Um, I think Platonism is false, is such a necessity. Um, if you disagree with me, you, will, you should think that Platonism is true, is such a necessity. Again, there's no, no, no way of proving by logic alone, from sort of logical axioms, uh, that Platonism is true nor of this group. But it's not the sort of thing that could vary between, po between metaphysically possible world. It's not like an alternate metaphysical possibility that, you know, sort of, in some possible world, Platonism is true, in others it's not. It just doesn't seem to be plausible. Another example. Um, seems to me very plausible that, uh, that all... I mean, I'm... I don't know. Seems to a lot of people, especially I think to Platonists, very plausible that all arithmetical truths are necessary. Right? Um, you know, it's just about numbers. You know, for Mass Last Theorem, even before we knew that it was true, we knew that either it was necessarily true or necessarily false. There's no other option for it. It can't just be the sort of thing that could change. As if, you know, God, when creating the world, that there is a God, would have to decide, am I going to make Fermat's theorem true or not? And the same seems to, it's very plausibly false for all arithmetical claims. But of course, as Gettle showed us, not all arithmetical claims can be proved. 
So, there are some arithmetical truths that, like all arithmetical truths, are necessary, have to hold, but nonetheless cannot be proved by logic alone. Um, and another plausible thing, it seems extremely plausible that um, the consistence that arithmetic, say the piano arithmetic or whatever your favorite axiomatization of it is, assuming you've got a good taste in axiomatizations, it's going to be a, a consistent axiomatization. But you cannot prove, but if it is consistent, you cannot prove that it's consistent. At least not within it. Um, but you add whatever other axioms you add to it and you get by the same thing. You can't prove consistency claims. Again, a Gödel's get get second theorem here. Um, and again, it seems like whether a bunch of stuff is consistent or not is just not the sort of thing that could differ between metaphysically, genuinely possible. Um, so this is metaphysical necessity. It's arithmetical truths have it. Um, facts like I'm not a number have it. There, there may be a lot more. Um, so for it, and, there, and, not, and a lot of these are going to be controversial. I, I mean, you know, something can be a necessary truth, but very controversial. Uh, the example I gave earlier, that Platonism is false, is a very controversial necessary truth. But whether you think it's, uh, I, if I'm right in it, you'll think that, if you think I'm not right about that, one will say that Platonism is true as a necessary truth. Okay. So when I talk of contingent truths, I mean the ones that are neither metaphysically necessary nor metaphysically impossible. In particular, the contingent truths are, are not going to be logically necessary or logically possible in any narrow sense. But I want something a little bit more to it than that, a little bit more. Wait, they're going to be logically possible, right? Narrow. So, so basically, I, I've got sort of, there's physical possibility, there's narrowly logical possibility, which just means you can't disprove it by logic alone, and there's broad metaphysical possibility, which is what I'll be talking about, um, which we cannot really, I think, I don't know, it's not clear that we can define, but we can give examples of it. Okay, so the big fact, so, so I gave two options for the big fact. Um, the second option is bigger than the first option, in that all the laws of nature, facts about constants and initial conditions, all those facts are contingent truths. Uh, perhaps there's some, some of you may have some technical worries about this conjunction, it's infinite. Maybe there are ways of reducing it. It, it may be relative to fundamental truths. I'm not going to worry about these details, though I do worry about most of Okay, now the argument let me give the cosmological argument. It's got two simple premises. Um, and this version, unlike many versions of the cosmological argument, is an inductive argument. And that means that you can accept the premises and still reject the conclusion. So the premises are, first, the explanation a premise. That the big fact has an explanation. Claim. And the second is the best explanation claim, but the best explanation of the big fact is creation by a perfect being. The perfect being said to itself, I want to make the big fact true. Or I want to initiate a state of affairs that could lead to something like the big fact, or something like that. Um, given these two things, it follows that probably there is a perfect being. You know, something could be the best explanation, but not be the correct explanation. Best explanation is relative to our present knowledge, um, relative to the present state of the science and uh, philosophical cleverness. So, probably, so all we can say is probably there is a perfect view from this argument. There are other possible arguments than this one. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about what a perfect being is, but not very much. But I will. So 
The first, uh, the philosophy of religion component of this talk is going to be two parts. One, where I give some thoughts in favor of explanation. That's going to be, in fact, most of this. And then uh, I'll give thoughts in favor of best explanation. Sorry, uh, maybe you're going to say something about this. What kind of explanation do you have in mind here? Is this like your uh, removal of puzzlement idea? Or what kind of explanation? Whatever kind allows inference to best explanation. I don't know what, you know, maybe they all do. Um, so surely you don't I mean, I do think explanation is something like a correct removal of puzzlement. You're puzzled by something, when you kind of get an explanation, you know, you, have a, you get some correct information that you're going to think removes the puzzle. I mean, you could get incorrect information that would remove your puzzlement. Um, you're puzzled as to why there's water spilled in the bathroom. Uh, uh, one of your children says that uh, his sister uh, did it. Your puzzlement is removed. But I'm not going to count it as an explanation unless it's true. So when I talk about explanations, I will I I mean true explanations. Um, so one route to explanation, uh, sort of uh, in mathematics, one of those things, uh, one of those there are tricks to proving things. The, a trick to proving uh, to proving an existential claim is to prove that every to prove that something has a property is to prove that everything has that property. Another trick, really common, is to, to proving that something has some pro nice properties to prove that almost everything has that property. So I'm going to use these kinds of tricks here. Um, and the first one is going to be an everything move. To start with this, this silly little question, why are there extremely few cubicle galaxies? as opposed to elliptical, spiral, or irregular. It's an amazing fact. You look out in the sky. I mean, I bet there are galaxies that are approximately cubical somewhere in the vast universe we're in. I don't know that we've ever seen any. Um, I guess some of the irregular ones sort of approached it, maybe. Um, but I don't remember seeing a picture. But anyway, they're extremely few. Why? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I guess I can come up with a sort of completely amateur sketch of how I think gravity is going to work, but I'm not going to do that. But suppose that, you know, we are puzzled by this and stymied, contrary to fact. We just couldn't find an explanation. You know, the, better, the best, you know, the smartest people in this room have worked on this, they just couldn't find anything. You know, in other rooms, at other universities, uh, we just couldn't see this. Um, well, here's something we wouldn't do. We wouldn't conclude that there is no explanation for why there are so few cubical galaxies. It wouldn't be like the case where we've searched for a drawer for a sock, we haven't found it, and we conclude that the sock isn't there. When we search for an explanation, it's not like searching for a sock, where it's a plausible move to say, I guess there isn't we will just think it's a still an open research problem. We will think there's an explanation we have And the principle of sufficient reason is sort of a very old principle that philosophers have given. Um, Nicholas of Cusa, I think, may have been one of the first to really push it. Uh, Leibniz popularized it the most, but it goes back to uh, um, the pre to Parmenides, one of the, the, in the fifth century BC at least. Um, that's a very general answer to this question of why we shouldn't just give up research for explanations. Namely, explanations aren't like socks. They, they can't be missing. They can at most be not found. Um, or they can't be utterly missing. And so the PSR, the principle of sufficient reason, says if P is a contingent truth, then there's an explanation for P. Now, that's the way I put it. It's not the way everybody puts it. Um, 
So you might ask, why are the contingent truths? Don't necessary truths have explanations? Yeah, some do. Right? Why is it wrong to torture innocent blue-eyed people? Because it's wrong to torture innocent people. Why is it wrong to torture innocent people? Because it's, uh, we have a duty of respect for other people. I actually think these are necessary truths. I couldn't be a world where the, the truths like this aren't true, but we can give an explanation for it. Um, mathematicians give explanations for things. Not always, but you can sort of distinguish as you read papers between those proofs that are explanatory of the theorem and those proofs that are not explanatory of the theorem. Sometimes it's just a matter of shuffling symbols around and by golly, it comes out right, it's got to be right. Or it's a really clever reductio ad absurdum uh, argument. But sometimes you read the proof and you see, by golly, yeah, now I see exactly why that's true. So there we've explained a necessary truth. But I don't know that all necessary truths can be explained. Um, and we don't understand mathematical explanation well enough, I think, to be able to say what explanation of necessary truths is like. Um, so I find it plausible to say that 0 equals 0 is a contingent truth that has no explanation. Contingent? Uh, you can read it the, uh, I meant necessary. <laughs> 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 a friend actually pointed out this typo to me in an email, and I looked at it, and it's still, and I didn't see what he meant. <laughs> <laughs> now I see what he meant. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's possible that zero because there's necessary truth with no explanation. Um, also, so I want to restrict the continuum truth in part because there seems to be counterexamples, but in part also because I, I don't think we really have a good understanding of how explanation between necessary truths works. I mean, there aren't very many philosophers who have, of mathematics that have worked on this question. There are a few. I think we're far from a, an understanding of what mathematical explanation is like. And as a result, we're far from an understanding of what explanation of necessary truths is like. And so I feel like we're not at the point of just understanding the terms when we're talking about necessary truths explanation of them, so I want to restrict the contingent ones. And that's fine, because that's the ones my uh, cosmological arguments based on. Um, maybe you could drop the restriction. I mean, maybe necessary truths are explained just by the fact that they are necessary. Um, another question about the formulation. Um, Leibniz famously says if P is a contingent truth, or if P is a truth, he may say more generally, is a truth, then there is a sufficient explanation. And he doesn't, I, I think, explain what a sufficient explanation is. Um, what does it mean? It doesn't mean logically sufficient, or even metaphysically sufficient. Uh, so that, you know, Q is an excellent, a sufficient explanation for P, then if Q is true, P couldn't but be true. Uh, Q enta logically entails P. Is that what it means? If so, then the principle of sufficient reason is false. Yeah. So the way you formulate it, well, so assuming uh, only propositions can explain propositions, <coughs> the way this is formulated, this can mean infinite regress and less necessary trees can explain contingent truths. Right. Um, so, I mean, could you maybe say a bit about why we shouldn't worry about that, given that we should worry about necessary oh, trees explaining oh, necessary trees? Oh, I will. It's, it's, sort, okay, of, okay. it's sort of like the fourth slide from the end. Gotcha. Um, definitely an excellent question, right? Um, and it's precisely because we don't want the explanations to be logically sufficient. If we wanted the explanations to be logically sufficient, right, we, I can even just sketch this, why the PSR is false, right? If, if the explanations are logically sufficient, then unless we're going to admit an infinite regress, we're going to in the end have a necessary truth that explains a contingent one. But a necessary truth cannot logically entail a contingent one. Would you, uh, would you tell us where you place uh, Newton, for example, who explained uh, three empirical laws of Kepler? Uh, what, uh, how do, where do you place him in terms of uh, this truth? That's a contention truth, I think. 
contingent truth explained by other contingent truths. Is it sufficient? Is it, uh... It's, I think it is actually. I mean, what I think is, I mean, I, I mean, you know, that's Leibniz, that's not me. Um, I take sufficient to just mean sufficient to explain. So I have to take the sufficient not to be doing the kind of work that some people think it does. But isn't, isn't there in the case of Newton something more than sufficiency when we had explained things other than what the original purpose was? I mean, it goes on to explain oh, yeah. lots of other things. Oh, sure. So, so my sufficient... More, doesn't it uh, validate the truth uh, when you have predictions? Oh, yeah. Uh, Oh yeah. So 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 so, so sufficient. So you haven't used the word prediction. So, so, no, I haven't. So sufficient doesn't mean um, merely sufficient. Um, it may oh, it may overrun the what is needed to explain p. It may explain some other things. Though not in the case probably where p is one of those really big facts because there's nothing to overrun it to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, what's the status of the PSR? In your is it a necessary truth? Is it like a methodological maximum? Well, you could, you could, you could, each of, you, you could say, I mean, I think it's a necessary truth, but you could take it as a methodological maximum and still run the argument. And just, you know, you apply the methodological maximum in the argument. Um, you might worry about the limits of the maximum. So you're saying PSR is a necessary truth? This is I'm not going to argue for this, but yes. Okay. Okay. Maybe some of my arguments implicitly. Well, maybe you can just explain to me how that might sort of go, because it seems pretty confusing to me. Since we're saying that we can explain the contingent truths sort of as we are, but any other way they might be, we could also explain them. It seems like we're not explaining why they are this way rather than another way. Because yeah. any way they would be, there would be an explanation for that. Yeah. So, um, so we'll, we'll see. The behind with me. That, that's the this is that that that's basically the objection, uh, the bandwagon objection that the PSR is incoherent um, because when you apply it to the big fact, you get a necessary truth, and then the necessary truth will also explain the big fact is false. But we'll, we'll look at that. Mm -hmm. Anna? Yeah. So maybe it's a stupid question, but is the um, so what does logical mean by sufficient? So is an alternative to logically sufficient for example, empirically sufficient, or does what what kind of role plays in logically? Well, I guess uh, here I'm uh, here I, I, either logically or metaphysically I'll reject both in this case. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure I understand. I, I just read really mean I don't want to do what Leibniz did and sort of insist that it's sufficient explanation, sort of ramp and sort of make it um, more impressive than just an explanation. I just want an explanation. It's, I think it's a kind of entailment, right? Maybe. Where the entailment might be understood in terms of necessity operating on the outside, material condition on the inside, and there might be different senses of this kind of entailment insofar as you interpret the box on the outside, the necessity operating on the outside. Varying degrees of strictness. No, my theory is right. just that the necessity is or necessary to are immediately uh, we are in the definition because, of course, logically a contingency won't be logically sufficient and then we might have the necessity. Yeah, well, I don't want sufficiency in that sense. And I think actually Leibniz doesn't either because he think, thinks that the contingent world can be explained by the nature, the necessary nature of God in some way. Um, so he's got some distinctions that might help him. Um, so I want to just stick to it. It's a continuum truth. There's an explanation. I don't want to add any further claims about what kind of an explanation it is. It's just an explanation. Let's not limit our options here. Um, but to many people, you know, the, the BSR is uh, self-evidently true. Right? It's not to, to the typical, to I think, the typical contemporary philosopher. It is, though, to undergraduates. You know, sort of, I, I, I run on my undergraduates often sometimes the Parmenides' argument against change. And the ar Parmenides' argument against, or against change depends on the principle of sufficient reason, that you can't give a reason as to why the changes happen at a the time they do, I mean, at some other time. 
And it, it's really striking, you know, nobody wants to conclude that there's no change, but also it takes a very long time before anybody questions the principle of sufficient reason, even though I write it on the board explicitly as one of the premises. That's not the one day challenge. Now, you know, okay, so maybe the, 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 the ordinary person's intuitions are mistaken, right? It seem, also may seem self-evidently true to a lot of people that, you know, simultaneity is not uh, dependent on reference frame and stuff like that, or, uh, or that the world is flat, or things like that. But, uh, you know, that is something that seems self-evidently true. There's at least some reason to think it, it's true. I mean, if we didn't have relativity theory, um, or anything like it, we would think that simultaneity is not relative to reference frame. And rightly so, in that case. If we didn't have all the evidence that the world's round, it would be quite appropriate, I think, to think that it is as it appears, flat. But we've got evidence to the contrary. So, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't do much. It, seem, it may not do much that it's self-evidently true. I guess you can worry about how strongly self-evidently true it is, but it does something. Um, sort of implicit in Einstein's thought that God doesn't play dice. Um, in fact, Einstein wants something stronger than the PSR. He wants sufficient explanations in some strong sense. He doesn't want God to be playing the dice. Um, I don't, I'm not playing with that. Um, you might wonder, you know, so what about people to whom it doesn't seem self-evidently true about contemporary people? I don't know. You may, maybe, you know, if, you, if, if one could defend, one could say, that maybe they've got a different understanding of the terms, and that's why they don't see it, or maybe they suffer from some more color blindness. I mean, why could it we try to defend the claim that the PSR is self-evident and true? But why bother? I mean, it's not helpful for discussion to stop with somebody to whom the principle seems false. But I do want to include the claim that the PSR seems self-evident and true to me, because in fact it is. It, it, it does, and that is very common intuition. Um, but one that is not argument. So I'm going to offer a couple of arguments in favor of the PSR, but aren't just self-evidence. So here's one thought. Um, we don't accept the PSR. We're not going to have a reason to persevere in searching for explanations. Um, I'm not saying all these arguments are equally good. Here's one uh, way, one thing to think. Um, I hear, so you might think this, and the PO I think do give us as some kind of an argument for metaphysical naturalism. But if you don't accept metaphysical naturalism, you'll give up too quickly and settle for easy supernaturalistic explanations. All right, it's, it, you can't find a natural one despite having worked hard for a decade or something. You give up and find a supernaturalistic god of the ass one or something. Um, that's bad. So you should accept metaphysical naturalism. Well, likewise, you know, if you don't accept PSR, you know, that's sort of by equal force, you, you're going to give up in your search for explanations, but you really should. These are pragmatic arguments. Um, do they give any reason to think PSR or naturalism is true, though? Well, I'm not sure. You could. You could give an alternative to the PSR and to naturalism, which is pragmatically about as good. Uh, typically, they're explanations, and typically, they are natural. Uh, yeah, sorry, if I reject the PSR, it's totally uh, consistent for me to say, here's a, here's a contingent fact. You should always look for an explanation. Yeah. By the way, there's no explanation of that fact. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> But you should look for one, even though you yeah. can't. Yeah. Yeah. I know there's an explanation for P, yeah. but I should look for an explanation for P. Yeah. No, that's fine. I, I'm okay with it. I mean, I mean, I think the PSR is true, but I, you know, I, that does seem a, that is a consistent position. Just as it's consistent to say P is true, but I need to search, but I need to look for more evidence before I get against P. P is true, but it might be false. Even I know that P is true. But you might be false. That's more controversial, but I think it's okay. Uh, <clears throat> for, for, for the non philosophers here, can, can, you, can you say something more about metaphysical naturalism? Oh, 
all seem self-contradictory. So. Oh, oh. Metaphysical naturalism. Naturalism is, is something like the claim that all the explanations of things in the world are naturalistic. Um, that's metaphysical naturalism. It, it, it's a distinguished from methodological naturalism, which is the claim that we should only look for naturalistic explanations. There might be others, but we shouldn't look for them. Or, at least as some, or maybe as scientists we shouldn't look for them, or we shouldn't look for them at all. We have a stronger and weaker version of methodological naturalism. The metaphysical one is the one that actually sticks his neck out and says, in fact, there are no supernaturalistic explanations. It's not just that we shouldn't look for them. There aren't. Um, yeah, I think actually this kind of pragmatic argument is a better argument for methodological naturalism than for metaphysical naturalism. And likewise, it would be a better argument for some of the methodological PSR than the truth of the PSR. Or you could have the alternative anyway, but that's the same pragmatic job to say, typically, there are explanations. You might worry. I mean, suppose you think this is the way to go, say, typically there are explanations. You might worry whether there's a way to measure this typicality. Um, but I'm going to try a different kind of argument that takes off from the last suggestion a little bit. Right? It seems, as we look around the world, we have a lot of successes of science. Lots of stuff has explanations. And well, there might be stuff where we sort of wonder, is, is there an explanation? Uh, there are going to be typical stuff happening around us. does have an explanation. Um, bricks don't appear for no reason at all in front of us, for no cause at all. These things just don't happen. Uh, so typical contingent trees have explanations. Why is that? It's sort of a vast massive fact about the world. Um, well, you know, sort of vast, massive facts about lots of stuff happening all across the world are the sort of things where, you know, even if you don't believe the PSR, you should you have some reason to think, yeah, I mean, that shouldn't just be a conspiracy. It's got to be. You know, you know I, I could buy that, with the, you know, there's a chance that a brick didn't appear in front of me for an apostle, but that didn't appear in front of anybody. Um, that's falls out for a bit more of an explanation. So why is it that typically contingent truths have explanations? Well, here's an explanation. The PSR is necessarily true. And so typically there are explanations because there always are. Um, it's an explanation. It may seem circular. Right? I may worry if the PSR is false, why expect there to be an explanation of why contingent truths typically have explanations. Um, but what I said about coincidences is that it applies. You might try to come up with some alternative explanation. You might pause it somewhere like you might say, well, but, you know, bricks and stuff like that, that would violate conservation laws. Um, and that's unlikely. Uh, maybe. Uh, it depends on actually whether this is a good reply on what your view of, of laws of nature are. If uh, you have a view of laws of nature as grounded in the causal powers of things, um, then those laws of nature probably couldn't prevent unexplained events from happening. And so that's not going to work. Um, if you have a sort of strong governance view, and you say there are conservation laws and governance, then that might be a good answer to why contingent truths typically have explanations. Um, Here's another little thought. I, you know, as long as there's any chance that something could happen for no cause at all, um, given the infinity of possible events and the infinity beyond cardinality, you can just come up, multiply events. Here's an event. Uh, Aleph 7, the photo is coming into existence. It's all in one shared state. Here's another one, I'll have eight of them. It's beyond cardinality how many possible events there could be. Um, if events can happen for no cause at all, and, and there's just this incredible infinity of possible events that could happen, what do you expect? That chance to be often realized contrary to observation. 
So maybe things can't happen for no cause at all. This is a very vague sort of argument. Yeah. Um, why, if there is only an infinity of possible terms, and if we know what is the rule of realization, how can we know that we can expect these events to be often realized? Don't we need that an assumption about the realization of possible events? Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of thinking, you know, look, you, you, you've got, there's some probability, maybe infinitesimal, that uh, for any particular uh, possible event that that would happen for no cause at all, if events can happen without any reason. Well, there's so many, and it seems like it's an independent question, would this one happen, would this one happen, would this one happen? Um, and as long as there's a lower bound on that probability, then you have some reason to think it's very likely that some of those would happen. Yeah? I mean, I'm, I'm confused. There's a certain, you know, there's a well-established spiel about probabilistic causation, about probabilistic explanation. Um, you explain, you know, you don't only have explanations of events um, um, if you have a deterministic uh, account of why they occur. You can also explain events probabilistically, so on sure. and so forth. Um, so I, I don't understand how to put together the following two claims. You're considering an event which has no explanation, and you're assessing the probability with which it occurs. Yeah, you think there's no way of assessing that? I, I, any such way of assessing would amount to a probabilistic explanation of its occurrence, I think. Or if it's not occurring. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Um, I find that very plausible as an as actually. Um, That might be the way to try to salvage the, uh, that last little bit of argument is to say, well, but yeah, sure, well, there are going to be chances, but there's going to be epistemic probabilities involved. And as long as they're, you know, they're all bounded below, bounded away from zero, it's going to be epistemically certain. just what the frequentist uh, wants. And, and we observe infinitely many independent events of some type. A fortiori, this is going to apply to you on finding. Um, you notice that the limiting frequency of some subtype A is one third. So you infer that the probability of an event of the big type being of subtype A is one third. Seems a very reasonable kind of inference. We would do it even after a smaller number than infinity. Except then we might say it's approximately. Actually, we'd probably say it's a third, because a third is such a nice number. <laughs> uh, standard justification for this rule is you apply the strong law of large numbers. And you say, well, look, almost surely the limiting frequency of independent outcomes equals the probability of the outcome. Now, you do an experiment um, and you count up how often the coin lands heads, and as long as your process are independent, 
the limiting frequency of heads and among your classes is going to be equal to the probability of getting heads on any one of them by the strong of large numbers, almost sure of the probability of one. Um, so that gives us some good confidence. Seems to give us some reason to think, yeah, you know, look, if, if, if we observed a third, if the probability was something other than a third, then that's the one we would have observed in our infinite sequence of independent events. So the fact that we observed a third gives us a very good reason to think that the actual probability is what we observe. Now, I am here assuming that actually this argument, I think, probably doesn't work if you think probability just are frequencies. And if you think that, we can discuss why you should, I don't think we should take that. Because if you think that, then of course, the inference in the first one is just a, a logical inference. That's just what it is for it to be a probability of one third. But I think that's, why that inference could be wrong? Right? I mean, look, a positive coin infinitely often, it could always come up heads. It just almost surely won't. Okay, but the standard justification is a catch for it. Good. Um, and, and this is actually going to, my argument is actually going to make, make use of David's uh, point about my last argument, which is why I so readily accepted it. Um, <laughs> so the catch is that the application of the strong law of large numbers needs an assumption. It needs the assumption that the outcome we are counting is measurable with respect to the underlying probability measure. Right? So you, you, know, you do your probabilistic modeling of a coin flip, you get that the limiting frequency of heads is good for a fair coin is going to be one half. But it's for the theorem to apply, you need that getting heads on a given toss is a measurable event, I mean, the one that the prob has a well-defined probability. So you mean, you mean measurable here in the, the sort of mathematical... In sense. the mathematical sense, yeah. You, you could have a set of points in two dimensions, which is not, you know, it's, it's not true that for every set there is a measure. Right, right. I, I mean, the most striking example of that is the Banach-Tarski paradox in three dimensions. You can take a, a continuous ball, um, and disassemble it into five or six pieces. Is it five? Five. five. Um, and put, uh, move those pe five pieces around to form two balls. Um, those pieces, are what, some of those pieces, in fact, I suspect all of them, but at least some of them are going to be non-measurable. Are going to be non-measurable because if we assign, yeah, two balls of the same size, it would be weird enough if they were different sizes too. Um, but yeah, two balls of the same size. So if they were all measurable. Um, then the volume of the ball would be equal to twice its own volume. Because you could disassemble it and form twice. So some of those pieces must be non-measurable ones we just cannot assign the probability to. Um, and that's a paradox you can get even a finite number of pieces. In one dimension you can get a similar paradox but they require an infinite number of pieces. But they're not to show that they are non-measurable sets. They're just, this is something, this assumes the axiom of choice. Um, that most mathematicians do. And so there are, in fact, right, in any in continuous cases, there are going to be situations that are non-measurable, where we just have no probability to measure. But here's a tempting thought. You could say, well, here's a, you had a catch. The catch was, yeah, your justification for inferring probabilities was that, um, was the strong law of large numbers. But look, that needed measure, the outcome to be measurable. Yeah, but look, what if it's not measurable? What do you expect? Wouldn't you expect a mess then, rather than this neat convergence to one third? I mean, you just wouldn't expect convergence to one third if you had non-measurability. Or you'd expect some really messy thing like measure the frequencies, and first you get a half, and then for a while, it's it's a tenth, and then for a while, there's no doesn't seem to be any kind of convergence. You just expect a mess. So if that's right, then that's an answer to the catch, because we do in fact get a frequency, so we should still infer one. Tempting thoughts actually false. Um, turns out that uh, 
if some event is non-measurable, then the event of there being a limiting frequency is maximally non-measurable. We cannot assign, make any probabilistic claims about it, not even that it's unlikely that there is a, a limiting frequency. Um, little theorem I proved last summer. Um, so, so what? Well, nothing probabilistically useful can't be said, so I can't say it's an unlikely limiting frequency. So the catch stands. It seems like to, to infer probability of A from the frequency, we need to assume at the outset that A is measurable. And no kind of pattern of occurrences of physical events or other events is unlikely if there is no measure, if, if, if we're dealing with non-measurable things. I mean, the theorem is that actually you can generalize the reasoning by a lot to all sorts of patterns. Um, so what? Well, then the hypothesis that A is measurable cannot be confirmed empirically. Or disconfirmed. What is well, the... Well, no, it could be disconfirmed, I guess, if you did an infinite number of trials and there wasn't confirmed. Is that a disconfirmment? But it can't be confirmed, yeah. So, so what, what, what are the assumptions about A that... I'm just thinking some event you do, you know, yeah. like you, you toss a coin and that's the type, and the subtype is the coin lands heads. Mm -hmm. um, and so I said, okay, for the inference the probability from the, for the inference from frequency to probability to work, you need measurability. And that's not an empirical, empirically confirmable hypothesis. So, it seems to me that to do science, we need to posit that physical events are probabilistically measurable, or measurable in some analogous way, even though we cannot confirm this empirically. Um, I think that this is kind of controversial, but the relevant probability measures the objective physical probabilities. That's the ones that we think are involved in the sequence. So, we need to posit that all physical events are governed by objective physical probabilities. Because if they're not, they're non-measurable, and then we can say nothing on the basis of even infinite sequences of observations. So events governed, this is the move David made against me, governed by objective physical probabilities, they've got at least stochastic explanations. Uh, and plausibly something analogous would be similar in this respect. In my, in my excuse, I say, you know, we philosophers are like lawyers. We just throw out a bunch of arguments, and we hope some of them stick with the jury. And, Hey, that's okay to give arguments that are based on different assumptions, that are even incompatible, because they'll appeal to some people and others will appeal to others. Um, it, it, in fact, makes uh, the case stronger in a way. Okay, so the PSR is true for all physical events. And it seems, then I say, and this is, uh, push on this, but it seems I've talked to say this, this is only true in the case of physical events. That's it's true. Yeah. Um, so what if you had some event that's governed by an objective physical probability of one half, like the coin flip? Yes. Well, uh, Take the contingent yeah. truth well, that well, this coin landed heads rather than the tail. Yeah. What's, we'll the, what's the explanation? We'll get there. Good question. Hey, everybody's pushing on the big objections, and, and, that, and that's good. Um, but I want to give first the arguments for the PSR, so that you have some motive to, you know, to, to think with me against the objections. Yeah? Tell me what you mean by the general case. Are you talking about the All contingent stuff. Contingent, oh, non-contingent, not contingent, but non -contingent. Yeah. Maybe they need more general one, but it, it, seems, it doesn't seem ad hoc to limit it to a contingent in the way that limiting it to physical might be. We don't even have a good picture, good idea of what the, phys what the physical really is. Would ghosts be physical? Stuff like that. The argument for the PSR in the case of physical events is that they have improperabilities. You don't think they're a kind of. Yeah, it's going to have to be not something like physical probability, it's going to have to be something like this. some other kind of something like probability line. Or non-physical probabilities. 
you continue, continuously talk about explanations. Science is not just about explanations. Science is about predictions of mm -hmm. facts that are not been observed, but which experiments that, are, that are going after the predictions are confirmed. So explanations is not the story of science. The story of science is about predicting what happens. Okay. And, uh, I wonder how this comes into, you know, into this discussion. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing science. Totally I'm, 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 totally I'm not doing science. I'm not doing science. I'm doing philosophy. I'm not doing science here. I'm, I'm not asking you to do science, but to, to notice that yeah. we're talking no, I mean, about. You know, sure, if you, if you can make novel predictions and stuff like that, that's, that's great and, and it adds evidence to the theory. But I think you could get pretty good evidence with, without any. any forward looking predictions. Imagine this thing. Imagine that um, we are that alien overlords come and forbid all scientific experimentation to us. But they don't understand our books. We've got all the records of all the experiments that have hitherto been done. Right? We've got all that stuff. And we read that and it's a sort of finite body of work we can master all of that experiments, we can still do science. We can still confirm, we can still get evidence for scientific theories, even though there's no point to making any novel predictions because we can't do any experiments to check them out. The aliens will stop us. Um, they'll kill us all if we do it. We better not. But look, we can, you know, we've got all the data we've got and there are limits to what we can do, but we can come up with better and better theories to fit the data that we already have. That's not an ideal situation, and, and we should rightly, in those cases, be more suspicious of our conclusions than if we could come up with more novel stuff. But we can still do something like science. So it doesn't seem to me it's essential to science that it make forward-looking predictions. So you're saying that predictions is not essential? It's not essential. It's very helpful. I'm sorry, but uh, what could you say? But there are different, if there are different explanations for the same phenomenon, how do you distinguish between them? In that case, you just have to, you may have to say, well, sometimes one of them is, is just obviously better. I mean, here's one. Look. That's not what happens in reality. Well, look, I can give you an explanation you just can't distinguish, right? I mean, take it the classical realm and suppose it, the hypothesis that, uh, that the force law due to gravitation is g m m prime divided by r to the epsilon, where epsilon is 2 plus 10 to the minus uh, billion. There's no way you can distinguish that experimentally, at least not within a classical realm, from Newton's law. But you know that that's, that's not the right story. But already you say you know, what does that mean? Well, you don't? You don't know what you mean, you know. You, 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 think it might be, you think that might be the right story? That uh, we, have no, we, we really don't know whether Newton's, uh, whether it's uh, squared or two to the or, or to the power of 2 plus some small delta? People are still searching experimentally for deviations from the Oscar at small actual distances. Currently, the experiments that are being carried out to try to determine to what extent that will happen at short distances. Do we have the. Okay, so suppose we don't say. The, the, yeah, I mean, but. Yeah, I, I, I did say in the classical realm, so that might rule out the short distances. And of course, there are worries about things like the, the, like the Voyager anomaly and things like that. Um, I think most of the people who are thinking about those anomalies still think most likely it's this inverse square law. And these other things this, just this, seem this much less likely. The most likely is well, look, we are totally against the whole philosophy of science, okay? No, science is surely, if it's, surely if it's 2 plus or minus, the experimental limit is. 2 plus or minus 10 to the minus 9. And someone says, look, I've predicted it, it's, it's, it's 2 plus 10 to the minus 11, and this confirms my prediction. Most people would say, sure, but we'll stick with Newton until we get something like 2, you know, 2 plus 10 to the minus 11 plus 9, 10 to the minus 12. We need that, if, if you're consistent with, with the null result, we should stick with the null result, surely. That's a practical issue, that's not, I mean, we can say more than just is the experimental limit. Oh, the whole goal of science is to continuously make more accurate experiments. We also and then, the truth. 
to, to see if it verifies or doesn't verify the assumption. Um, yeah. Yeah. But and that means you predict things. Uh, this this well, whole discussion is about explaining things. Well, so it, it, on, it, well on, this, on that kind of view, we never know any scientific claim. And maybe we never even have more reason to think it than to, to be more likely to be you know, in centuries of progress that have been made with this scientific philosophy. Well, is it progress, though, if on this view we do not know any of that to be true? And we do not even think it more likely true than not. That doesn't seem like progress that we talk about. I think we should uh, let you go on to... Uh, okay. There'll be lots of time for a discussion at least tomorrow on this, and maybe later today. So I think I will go on. Um, Especially since you're not doing science, actually, at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I am defending still doing science, even if the aliens come and forbid experiments. <laughs> Whereas uh, maybe some people would have to say, well, we just have to quit. Can I ask a question on a different subject? Uh, just How different? On, top of, I mean, on what you just talked about here. So you're saying uh, it seems ad hoc not to extend this to the general case beyond physical events. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering which things you think are in the general case. So particularly, one thing that comes to mind about physical events that are also contingent truths is maybe the physical laws. Um, but uh, we've been talking a lot about Hemian accounts of laws recently. And do you think sort of all the laws do or, or give concise summaries of the physical events or some, some facts that are useful in giving a lot of information about physical events, then, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm worried about like, what else do you think we really need to explain. So we can explain each physical event in a sort of causal explanation and explain that these laws are just summaries, of, good summaries of the events. The reason they're laws is because they're good summaries, and how much left is there to, to be explained? Well, I mean, there is going to be a question whether you go from the laws are a good summary to the laws are explained, right? They could be a good summary and still have an explanation, right? So here's one, right? I mean, I don't think this one is, is, is correct, but take Malebranche's explanation, right? So God likes certain patterns of behavior in the world. And God arranges things so that they have those patterns of behavior. God so arranges that whenever water is heated past a certain temperature, a certain pressure, it boils. And it's not that there's even any causation or anything other than of the human regularity sort between the boiling and between the, the raising of the temperature and the boiling. It's just that God makes it boil whenever the temperature goes past a certain point. Um, it's a fairly standard Islamic view still to our day. Um, so on this kind of a view, we, yeah, the, the laws are, there's nothing but just regularities of things happening. But nonetheless, there's an explanation of these regularities. It's not an explanation that I think is the correct one. But it's, it's a, at least there's a prima facie explanation. So it seems like, yeah, there, there's room for further explaining, even on the human view of laws. But even if there's room for further explaining, it seems like we already have some sort of explanation because we've explained each of the physical events that constitutes the regularity. So all, all you've said is that we need to have that. The PSR just said that there needs to be an explanation for each thing. You yeah. know. Um, good. So, so, there are, so there, there's room for further explanation. I think the fact that there is room. I, so suppose, you, you know, suppose uh, um, you're a human and you die and go to heaven and at the, at the pearly gates, Malabranche meets you and says, I was right. And this is the gates of heaven. And he's past the gates, so you know he's not lying. <laughs> so now he's saying, oh, my golly, now I understand why all these regularities were true. There was something I didn't, and I think you would have this feeling, there was something I didn't have an explanation for before. And now Malabranche has given me this explanation. There, I didn't know why these regularities were true. And it, even though, you know, yeah, sure, there, there were, these were regularities and they were, uh, and there were the instances of them and all that, and you knew all that, but there was something about them you didn't know. So I think this suggests to me that, uh, in fact, we don't know all the, the explanations of the regularities in the human view. They may be metaphysical, 
this might be, this, I was talking to Chris about this yesterday at lunch. It may well be that this is a case where a metaphysical grounding and explanation come apart. It may be that the laws are grounded in their instant, human laws are grounded in their instances, but that does not mean that they are explained by their instances. I mean, non-nomic regularities, that's exactly what we want to say. Right? We want to say about non-nomic regularities that they are grounded in their instances but not explained by their instances. Okay. Uh, depends on the regularity. Yeah. I mean, there, there's this word that well, I think Laudlin pushed it, that on this human understanding of law is sort of an explanatory circle where it does look as if the regularities explain the laws in some sense. Or whether that's understood in terms of grounding or uh, some sort of uh, dairy necessitation, truth making. Uh, but then, as the suggestion was here, I think, in the question, from the questioner, uh, you do think that the laws, in some sense, explain the regularities by serving as summaries, or, you know, there's this unification understanding of scientific explanation that Friedman and I think uh, Kitcher and others have pushed. And so there's this worry about a circle of explanation on this understanding of laws. And so it's like, you know, it wouldn't be good to invoke this particular view of laws in response to this, it seems that how not takes into the general case, quote, the truth is, uh, because the theory of laws is just uh, flawed. But I, I mean, I know there are responses to that kind of objection, but I, I think Tim's on the same thing there. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I think that's right. So, so, so I think whether this is a, uh, that this objection is going to work is going to depend on whether cert, you, can, you're, you, you can have circular explanations at least when the circle, the, the two arrows in the circle are different types. And I'm inclined to think even when the arrows are different types, you can't have a circular explanation. Yeah. So I don't believe this is true, but let's say that we ultimately found that there's only one self-consistent mathematical structure that describes all representable laws. To you, would that count as an explanation for, for those laws? I, let me see. There is only one, is the claim, there's only one mathematically consistent structure, or there's only one that harmonizes with, with our observation? Yes, there's only one mathematically consistent structure that describes all the things we observe in the world. No, I don't think so. I, I, I think you would still, I mean, you would still want to know why that structure is the case. There are others that could have been true. Now, if it turned out that for some really odd foundations of mathematics reasons, there's only one consistent mathematical structure, then may, then I guess we would have some kind of necessitarianism. That's, that's kind of what I'm thinking about. And, and then, yeah, that's... yeah that, that would be fine. I mean, there would be just one way for things to be. Maybe arithmetic is inconsistent, but there's something else that's consistent, and that something else is the only thing that is consistent. For all propositions P, either P is inconsistent or P is true. Yeah, so that would be an explanation. I just don't think it's very likely that that's Yeah, the I, I don't either. But yeah, I, 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 I would be happy. I think I would, I would take that to be a kind of explanation. And that turned out to be true. Because I'm, I'm happy with explaining physical things by mathematical things. Um, seems like facts about orbits are explained by facts, by mathematical facts. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like the argument on this slide assumes that uh, as long as a physical event has a non-zero chance of occurring, uh, the probability is enough to explain why the event occurred. I, yeah, I, 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 and that seems like a controversial view of uh, probabilistic explanation. I mean, that, yes. it's a view of Solomon and Handel, yeah. I guess, but it doesn't fit well with uh, so Yeah, it's a weak view of explanation. Um, so then I just say, uh, yeah, we have explanations at least in a week sense. But I do, th yeah, but I do in fact take that, that view that it is an explanation no matter how low the probability is. And I'll, I'll say a little bit in favor of that. So maybe, maybe I should go on. Um, here's another little fun argument. Um, consider this one. Uh, I think this is not true. No, it's not true. Suppose it's true. All my colleagues just pet, I know, have a dog. And there are many colleagues whose pet I know. 
that's meant to be an inductive argument. So every colleague has a dog. Now, it's not meant to be deductively valid, but it's meant to be so probable every colleague has a dog. Inductive argument from this is really bad. Right. All I really should infer is that all my colleagues who have pets have dogs. I should not infer. I have no. I, I don't. I haven't been given information about whether all my colleagues have pets. All I have information for is that all the colleagues that have pets have dogs. Okay. Now. Here's something true. We have very good empirical reason to think that every present organism has an evolutionary explanation. What is that very good empirical reason? Well, you know, lots of lots and lots of detail. But by the way, this isn't an argument of mine. This is a, one of a grad student of mine, and I can't remember who it was. Well, someone <laughs> came up with it in class, raised his hand, and made this this, this really neat little argument um, without the dog parallel. Um, Okay, so what is it? Well, here's a plausible one, a story. All the present organs we know the explanation for have evolutionary explanations, right? We've got evolutionary stories about bunches of organisms, present ones, maybe a bunch of past ones as well. You can fill that in in various ways. But I'm just sort of giving a thumbnail sketch, right? So all the present organs we, have, we know the explanation for have evolutionary explanations. There are many present organisms we know the explanation for. If it wouldn't be impressive if there was just one organism we had an evolutionary explanation for, and then we could look, oh, so evolution is true. But there are many of them. So, every present organism has an evolutionary explanation. Well, the way, that seems to be an instance of the bad argument that I gave before. Right? Just substitute um, whose pet I know, who they gave. We know the explanation for to whose pet I know. And have a dog is in place of, uh, has an evolutionary explanation. But it seems like all I am justified in inferring from these two claims is that every present organ that has an explanation has an evolutionary one. Just like all I'm justified in inferring is that all the dogs have pets and dogs. But that, that's not all we believe. We don't just believe that all the present organisms that have explanations have evolutionary ones. We think that all the present organisms have evolutionary explanations, or at least I do. Um, um, so how do we get that, uh, that every present organism has an evolutionary explanation? It seems to me that the only way, a good way I can think of actually, is to say, well, there's the PSR, which tells me that it's not like about pets where some of my colleagues might lack them, explanations aren't the sort of thing that organisms can lack. So, the fact that all the explanations I know are evolutionary implies that, uh, all, the exp uh, that all of them, uh, the items in the class, have evolutionary explanations. Right, that's, that's plausible. That's probable. Here's a good empirical reason to think that. Um, but we need the PSR. Otherwise, we just as we can't, on the basis of, the, of this day, data, we cannot conclude that every colleague has a pet, so too on the basis of the data, we can't conclude that all the present organisms have explanations. So, but given the PSR, we can. So, PSR is part of, a, a good part of what it seems to be needed to give us evolution on the basis of the data. A sort of a strong evolutionary view in which all the organisms have evolutionary explanations. Yeah? It seems like a much weaker or better kind of book the job, which is that if one organism has an explanation, it's the kind of all good, but all things that are given time have the same kind of explanation. Mm -hmm. That falls a long way short of uh, allowing you to infer that ever that that would do the job of making this argument good without uh, yeah, yeah. I see. So it's good then. Can I use that to leverage my way to a PSR? Um, okay, well, look, the the well, suppose I do this. this. Well, I mean, suppose I say this. Every, um, if some plurality of 
uh, material, uh, some plurality of contingent objects has an explanation. By the same token, every plurality of contingent objects has an explanation. Oh, well then take the plurality of all contingent objects. They'll have an explanation too. I think you might have the organism with a natural time. And the natural time can share the kind of explanation. Contingent object seems a natural time. At least it's natural in the David Lewis sense of not being gerrymandered, not being, not being something like a horse or a cat. Darwin offered this explanation based on his observations. Uh, I don't know whether he read or he didn't read Leibniz. I'm sure he didn't matter. What's important is that after his, what is it, one or two centuries since Darwin offered the explanation, the evidence has supported the predict. There was a prediction of Darwin that this is what explains the variety. And so if the prediction that matters, the correctness is the prediction, not the explanation of what Darwin said he observed, but that he predicted it for all observations. And today, there hasn't been any contradiction to, to Darwin's predictions. So again, prediction is what matters, and not explanation at all. Yeah, I, I guess I would just... Do you agree with this? No, I will just disagree on that. Sorry, is, is prediction just not a type of, are they not just types of one another? So, uh, if, if general relativity is true, then light bends around the sun. If general relativity is true, then the perihelion of Mercury will shift slightly. We learned about a lot of those before, the perihelion shift. We learned about the bending around the sun after general relativity. I mean, yeah. There might be an old evidence problem for Bayesians, and we talk about that, but there is no old evidence problem. Uh, you know, the, the order in which I learn one and the other doesn't matter. If, 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 if GR is true and explains those facts, the fact that one came before the other one makes one a prediction type of explanation versus a retrodiction type of explanation. Well, predictions are helpful because they, they tell us that, that, that um, Einstein didn't cook up this theory just to explain the. He could have very cleverly cooked up this theory just to explain something you already knew. So that helps, but you know that might be unlikely anyway. But we, I, I, I can think of prediction as just being a part of explanation and then the the final of the race. I mean, this is a very fine question of what, how exactly scientific reasoning works. I do think, in the end, inference to best explanation is probably the way to go for a lot of things. Um, Part of the reason I think that is because I think there are serious problems in the Bayesian alternatives, but I won't want to go into those. I want to now talk about the arguments against the case. Um, so here's one that we sort of intuitively had. We, we, we have of this, right? So you've got an electron in a mixed up-down state, um, and it's sent through a spin measurement device which measures its spin is up. What explains this result? Well, Here's my suggestion, um, which, you know, I get, you get, one gets incredulous here, and one suggests things like that sometimes. Then the other thing was later in spin up is explained by the fact that it was an estate which had an up component. With normal mathematical square coefficient at least 9 25 Notice that's less than half. <coughs> I think that explains it may not explain it as well as the explanation we would have of it going down. We would have had a better explanation had it gone down. But PSR says nothing about how good the explanations are. It just says they're good enough. If we measure the spin down, we would have a different explanation. Notice that the things we, that the thing that, in, that we explain, the sp that I, on my story, explain the spin up in terms of, is also true in the case where the spin goes down. But it, in that case, it doesn't do any explaining. I actually think these things might even be count in some sense. A philosopher of science talk of contrastive explanations, and they love them when, we, when they can get them. Um, 
I actually think this explanation might even have a contrastive in some sense. Here's a sense of contrastive explanation. E contrastively explains not just yp, but yp rather than q. If and only if E explains yp, and E would not explain yq, were q rather than p true. My little somewhat dubious explanation here, I mean, I, you know, I do feel the pull of saying there's something fishy here. Um, but I'm willing to fight that. I, you know, I think one of the things we learned is uh, in philosophy and in science that reality is a bit fishy in places. There was weird stuff going on. Yeah, but, but um, I'm a little confused. In, in, uh, in the explanations you're citing here, the, the, the explanons in the first case, the, the explanons in the second case is a logical consequence of the exponents in the first case, given that you represent things by normalized quantum states. It's not. Come yeah. down. Because this says at least, and this says at least. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. OK. OK. Good. That's another reason why I don't want equal. <laughs> right. <laughs> I didn't think of this reason for why I don't want equal. But, um, yeah. So. If it hadn't gone up but had gone down, or if it, it hadn't gotten and measured us up but had we measured us down, this explanation would have been true. Namely, this statement would have been true, but wouldn't have been an explanation. So in that weak sense, it's contrasted. That's the most I can get as a contrasted explanation. But it's, well, it's an explanation. It's not like something that it just plain happened. There's no cause at all, no explanation at all. Just out of nothing, we had an electron that Generalize the point. Um, so the Van and Wyden gives this argument as some of you picked up on as soon as we saw the PSR. Um, and the way he does it is he says, okay, let's start with the BC, BC, I don't even explain what that stands for. I just used BCCF so long. BCCF is a big contingent conjunctive fact. Yeah. If you just jump back to the previous example, if it really was 50-50 for both outcomes, are you saying that that would not count as a good probability yes. explanation? It would. I mean, I, it, but, I, but uh, the case I gave, it was less than 50 for the one that happened. And it's an even better one when it's 50. I kind of think that you know, the higher the probability, the better the explanation. I could even be persuaded. I think I am kind of actually persuaded that even in some cases of probability zero, you have an explanation. I mean, that's a tough thing to hold. But I, I'm inclined to think that, that, that when you throw the dart, with the perfectly defined tip at the dark board, and then lands at precisely that point. There is actually a probability, zero probability explanation there. But that's very controversial. And I don't know things like that actually come up in quantum mechanics and stuff. Yeah. But is there that any physical event that doesn't have an explanation of exactly this type? No. I mean, any. So, <laughs> well, of this of the of the quantum type, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But I mean, if you give me a physical event, I, I think I can argue that there is uh, some probability, you know, vanishingly small, that that event happened. Mm -hmm. So there could, be. and yeah, I mean that could be right. The PSR is true. <laughs> As I said. Okay, so you've got the big contingent conjunctive fact. So this is this is sort of the big argument again for PSR. It's in Van Wagen's book on free will. Um, sorry, can I just ask you? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but on um, the previous point, if we have a situation where we can say one of the following things will happen, um, and then one of them happens. Is that an explanation? But that's in not always. Not always. Not if you time travel to the future, or if your friend time traveled to the future told you what was going to happen. No, I'm saying in the case of oh. just the case of the, the quantum yeah. case. You know, um, you you could even if you don't know the probabilities, you may know the range of outcomes or this the right. set of outcomes, and you can say two in that case. Because I'm intrigued by Andrew's suggestion that you know if the probabilities were 50-50, you said you would still regard that as an explanation. Well, 
I mean, uh, notice that even if it's 50-50, Um, the experiment, the stuff in, the, in here, um, maybe in some way, I mean, I, I don't actually want to endorse probability raising account of uh, explanation, but these are actually, I think, probability raising. Namely, suppose that, you know, at, at least in part, right, I, I mean, without this stuff, the electron might not be being measured. There might be no electron. To be measured. There is uh, some stuff here that raises the probability of the outcome as well, even if I don't think probability raises this. I mean, the explanation includes the existence of the electron. That sure raises the probability of it being measured to have a spin up. But I want more than just that. So I, I want to go back to this. Okay, so we've got the, this big conjunction of all contingent truths, right? All of them. So this is the second of my big facts on my first slide. And I suppose, and then I put early to PSR, it, it has an explanation because the conjunction of contingent truths is itself a contingent truth. Okay, that explanation is either itself contingent or necessary. It says that again. Again, well, if it's contingent then it's a conjunct in this big bad, and hence self-explanatory. Because P explains that big conjunction, and so in some way, in some sense, it seems to explain every conjunct of it, and including itself. But it seems absurd to think that a contingent proposition should explain itself. I'm not 100% sure that it's absurd, but it sure seems. Second option, and this was the one that was pushed on me at the beginning, if P is necessary, then it cannot explain the PCCF, says it says by the way, or no necessary truth can explain a contingent one. Why not? I'll grant that no contingent truth can explain itself, but now the big question is why think that a necessary truth can't explain a contingent one? Well, here's the kind of reasoning if you ask uh, Peter Van Ewey, I mean, here's the sort of thing he'll tell you, uh, or at least I've heard him say, uh, P would still be true even if Q were false. Right? As necessary, Q would still be there even if the contingent one were false. That seems really weird. But that's only, I think, a problem if you accept something like this principle. If P explains Q, then P entails Q. And Q follows from P. Because if you don't accept this principle, then you admit, yeah, you can have cases where P, P could still be true without Q and still find explanation. So Peter Van Inwagen's argument, and as he gives it in this book, depends on this principle entailment, entailment principle, which is false. Um, all good scientific explanations ever given violate. There may be some bad ones that have been given that don't violate. For instance, the ones that involve incoherent <laughs> explanations don't violate it, because an incoherency entails everything. Um, we saw this, I think, uh, in the quantum case. If you bought my story, then you will have seen an explanation where there is no entail. person probably didn't do it. Here's another fun one. I kind of like this one. Uh, this is from... Okay. Be, uh, the Sherlock Holmes story, the Silver Blades one. Why did the dog not bark? I'm going to give it away, I'm sorry. The dog didn't bark because none of the causes of barking were present. There's more details to what the relevant causes not present were in the story. I won't get that. But, you know, sort of, as an outline, why the dog did not bark? Because none of the causes of barking were present. Now, the PSR is either true or false. If it's true, the Van Enwagen objection can't be right. So, suppose it's false. If it's false, then that none of the causes of barking were present does not entail that the dog did not bark. Because it could have barked for no reason at all, if the PSR is false. So the opponent of the PSR cannot accept entail if she's willing to say the very sensible thing that the dog did not bark because none of the causes of barking were present. 
I also think, I mean, maybe it's an incautious thing, right? Um, we even have uh, cases where if you talk, uh, where, where scientists say things that sound like could they explain contingent truths in terms of mathematical ones. Now, maybe that's elliptical for some longer explanation. But at least it sounds on its face like why do the orbits have this character because of this theorem. Some people think that identity claims, which you might think are necessary, explain. So some people might say that the mind is identical to the brain and that that does explain full work. Um, in which case, you have a necessary yeah. truth explaining some contingent truth or some contingent truths. Not right. Sure buy that example. Right. Or you might even think, yeah. Um, you might think, for instance, uh, that bi the biological kind, uh, uh, that some biological kind claims are necessary. So, for instance, that horses are mammals is a necessary truth. I mean, you could surely, you can have, I guess, you know, a weird evolutionary story could produce things that are, you know, scaly and. Uh, uh, and yet descended from horses, but would either not count us as horses, or we would still count them as mammals that have an odd sort. So horses are necessarily mammals, but it seems like the fact that all horses are mammals explains a bunch of stuff about horses. A bunch of contingent stuff. <laughs> so I am worried about um, this bit here, quoting the, that none of the causes of barking were present does not entail that the dog does not bark. What if Give you had a denial of PSR? Yeah. yeah, right. What if you had a view of emissions which treated them as higher order totality facts? Right. Then wouldn't the relevant omission entail? I don't think so. No. Okay. Yeah. Just on this, I mean, it seems reasonably clear that what's needed isn't just that a necessary fact can picture in the explanation of the contingent fact, but that the necessary fact alongside no other contingent fact, that's a sufficient for explanation, right? It does seem so, so, you know, why do you always have this character have these features? Well, because they're elliptical, and it's a theorem that elliptical shapes have these features. Why do you force have these features? Because it's also mammals, and because mammals have some. Yeah, so there's going to be a question of uh, whether the more truncated version is still an explanation or not, especially in the mathematical case. And I think, that's right, somebody might think, no, it's not. It's not that the theorem explains why the orbits are like that. It's the theorem together with some laws. And, and, and then that particular argument goes out the door. Where it goes. <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry, I'm a bit worried about um, when you say that physical facts might be explained by non-mathematical facts. Um, wouldn't, uh, so if I accept this argument, wouldn't this mean for me that I'm a realist about mathematics so that I don't have to necessarily accept that there is some, some word of mathematical proof or whatever that these mathematical objects exist or something like this or can I, because I the scientist would just um, like to see mathematics as kind of a tool by which I can describe reality um, just like we discussed yesterday in the account, I guess uh, if I understand this correctly that it's just the best tool to simple descriptions of, of things. I, but by your account, isn't it a strong platonism or mathematical reality? No, it's, it's a mathematical, I, I am a mathematical realist, mm -hmm. I guess, but I'm not a platonist. Okay. So I think mathematical truths are, you know, there are mathematical truths, but, I, but, but I, I, I'm one of those uh, larger, somewhat logicist types, and I think all mathematical truths are I mean, if then, so I think all mathematical truths are of the form if this, then that. If these, if some system satisfies these axioms, then this happens. Um, there may be platonic objects. I mean, I, I, I tend to think Platonism is false, as I said, but there may be platonic objects. So pla platonic objects might be plugged into the antecedent. They might satisfy that system. But I don't actually think that mathematics would be about just about those platonic objects. I think it's a general, mathematics is a general claim about if this stuff is true, then that's true. That's a very controversial view of uh, mathematics. And the only reason I bring it up is to say, look, you, you, can, you, can, you can say there are mathematical truths without being, uh, thinking that there are mathematical objects. 
So I, I share exactly that view. Um, but, but I also think that, that you can make that consistent with, with Platonism if you just say that the actual objects of Platonism are these mathematical structures that all have this, this if-then character. It's not the axioms, it's not the theorem where the mathematical truth lies, it's, it's a relational view of Platonism. I don't like structure as an entity, but I can certainly do that. It's probably time for our coffee break. Is it? Okay. When do we usually take that? Uh, yes. Yeah. About, ten minutes ago. About 10 minutes ago. So we should take a, a, a break and return in 20 minutes.